Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 162, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, on today's show, we're going to be taking you back to a simpler time. A time where guys had massive perms, where <laughs> <laughs> the manager would drive the guys home and have a plate of chips afterwards. He'd lock them in a room, force them to drink champagne before the cup final. When he went to see a game of football, it was probably about, what, five quid to get in, probably? You went through the turnstiles and you had the football rattle standing up in the stands. We're talking about football in the 80s today. Weeing in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the toilets were generally like a bucket, weren't they? Yeah, at best. Yeah. So today, the reason we're talking about football in the 80s is because we're going to be talking about one of the most famous and earliest football management simulators. Yeah, so this is Football Manager and it's not the one that you see in the shops now, Football Manager 2019. But this is the original one, and we talk about the kind of development of all the different aspects of the game. You know, this was a, a really hard kind of game to put out there. You know, how do you make something exciting? Yeah. And it, it's, it's seen as if you're not into football, not that interesting. But Dan, he's, he's not that much of a football guy. He absolutely loved the interview today, didn't he? Well, this interview is so fascinating. I mean, for me, I mean, like, like you said, I've never been a real big football fan. I mean, my, my family were, you know, my dad and my uncle. And I remember, like, you know, Saturday afternoons watching Saint and Greavesy on TV and we go to football matches. I did go to a few as a kid. I always loved the atmosphere of it. And, I mean, I actually do prefer playing probably video game football to watching it on TV, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I used to get, like, go to matches and stuff with my family and everything, mm. but then I really got into it, like, just near university period and kind of uh, really got into football then. But also, I never really got far with the modern football manager games. I'd always, always try and get the rubbish teams and bring them up <laughs> to really high levels, and that was incredibly hard to do. I just think football back then, in the 80s, it seemed to be full of characters, didn't it? Yeah, it seemed to be full of characters, and they all weren't multimillionaires like no, they are now, so they, they're all not prima donnas. <laughs> so get yourself a, a little plastic cup of Bovril, and today we're going to be reminiscing on those early 80s kind of football memories and talking about Football Manager with the original author, Kevin Toms, and also we'll find out about his new version, Football Star Manager. If you love that original game, it's back. Yeah, and this is this is on mobile phones and it's doing fantastically well at the moment. You might recognise Kevin because he used to have his bearded face plastered on every kind of piece of merchandise back then. And why not? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So we're going to be catching up with him. Um, he lives in New Zealand today, so another call that we're doing, you know, um, halfway around the world again. It seems to be a bit of a trend recently, doesn't it? So he's going to be coming up, Kevin Toms, talking about the history of Football Manager, coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in the next 15 minutes. Now, we've got some really cool news stories to talk about this week, including the rebirth of one of the most legendary 90s Amiga magazines that's back in a new form, Amiga Power. Ooh, and also a Tetris player that's got further than anybody ever in the world. <laughs> All these years later. Yep. So we'll talk more about them in just a minute. Now, before we do, let's give a big thank you to the people who make it possible for Ravi and I to come in here, get away from our day-to-day -day life, um, but we can come in here every week and update you on what's happening in the world of retro and talk to our childhood heroes as well. We love doing this show. But the only reason that we can keep doing it is thanks to your support. Now, we do have a little tip jar on the front page of our website at theretrohour.com. Any amount that you donate into there, big or small, it all goes into the pot and helps us with the running of this podcast. And for doing it, making a little donation, you will find your place in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week... Franklin Hairs. Paul Edwards. Graham Beresford. And Andreas Sunner, who all made donations into the running of the show. And you can do the same. We've got a little supporters link on the front page of our website at theretrohour.com. Now, let's talk about this amazing Nintendo Classic map site that you found. Yeah. I've been playing around with this for hours today. Well... It as we know with Nintendo, everything seems to go down really quickly. So <laughs> I hope this is available on Friday when we talk about it. This is noclip.website and it's an absolutely amazing idea. It's Actually, we used to do this quite a lot on the Amiga when we were kids, but it's the levels. Yeah. But it's a full kind of version of the level that you can fly through yeah. and explore. And they've got tons and tons of nintendo games on this when it used to be bitmaps you used to be able to look at the bitmaps and see all the different parts of the level now you can spin around in 3d and see everything this goes back i mean i'm looking at the list of games we've got on here 
Um, stuff like, you know, Mario Kart on the DS, the GameCube, Mario Kart Double Dash, Luigi's Mansion, stuff on the Wii, uh, back to the N64, even a couple of Sega games on here as well. Got like Sonic Mania has been mapped by them, which, you know, is a very recent game. But yeah, the idea is that you can get an overview of these maps and these kind of courses of racing games and that kind of thing, look at them overhead and zoom in and follow the track around and check out the different areas of them too. Go into areas you've never been in. Yeah. And just kind of see if there's any secrets or, you know, little map glitches or anything like that. And it looks amazing as well. I mean, you know, really high resolution scans up the done of these levels too. Yeah, it's a, it's a full open source project. So, you know, this has been all kind of compiled by one guy called Jasper, and yep. he's he's just keeping it going. And uh, they're saying, you know, ooh, will this new fan fame on social media kind of cause Nintendo <laughs> to take it down? And as you've heard, Bowser's now in charge of Nintendo. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Bowser, I don't think. <laughs> so they're saying, is anything's going to go these days? You don't know. I mean, they've got, you know, current stuff on there, like Mario Odyssey and stuff, which I imagine might anger Nintendo a little bit. Hopefully not. Because, I mean, this is a cool little fan project, and I think from... My perspective, there are two really good things about this. Number one, if you want to kind of, you know, if you're lost in a game, yeah. obviously it's quite handy for yeah. that. But also from a perspective of looking how level design's done in games. Yeah, yeah, it could be a good kind of learning tool as well. Yeah, and you know, if you are, I mean, that's why we do this show. We're a little bit kind of interested in the backstory of games and how they work and the technology, you know. We're nosy guys, we like to look at stuff like this, so hopefully Nintendo will leave it alone. Yeah, I hope so. If not, there's a couple of Sega things in there. Need to get more Sega stuff. Sega are always fine with everything. <laughs> I'll just put Mika stuff up. No one cares. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you can map them. Yeah, it's dead easy in Doug's paint, couldn't you? So if you do want to check out the site, um, I'll put it in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Check it out while you can. Well, you know all the old worms levels? You could actually put them into Deluxe Paint and edit, mess around edit with them. them and mess about <laughs> with those, yeah. Yeah, me and my brother used to do that. Rude drawings in the background and things. What's that worm standing on? Anyway, talking about the Amiga, let's chat a bit about Amiga Power. Now, that was back in the day. Did you read Amiga Power? No, I didn't, but I heard of Amiga Power by Amiga Power readers or right. people who go, have you read this? It's so shocking. It used to be, I mean, the, the strapline was the magazine with attitude. Yeah. And the thing about it is they didn't really care who they annoyed. They didn't feel the pressure to give games high ratings if they didn't want to. They annoyed a lot of people. I think they were in Team 17 and a bit of a fallout publicly yeah, on, that, on yeah. using that. I remember we went to a talk held by Amiga Power at the Guardian building. We and did. That, that was awesome. Yeah, that was a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? Still a lot of interest in it. And I think out of all the kind of British Amiga magazines back in the 90s, for many people that's the most fondly remembered. And now the good news is, all these years later, Amiga Power is back in a new form. It's coming out as an album. Now, we've actually got on the phone the man who is behind the relaunch of Amiga Power as a double music CD, Matthew Smith. Welcome to the show. Hello there. Now, tell us about your um, kind of memories of Amiga Power then. I guess you were a big fan of it back then. I was a huge fan, yes. I mean, I, I started um, reading it um, just before I got my actual first home computer, which was an Amiga 500 Plus, uh, back in late 1991. And uh, it was one of the first magazines I picked up, and I just loved it straight away. Um, this was back in the day when uh, it was still the original editor, Matt Bealby. And uh, it was pretty much right from the start, exactly as it went on to be, just full of um, really imaginative features, um, incredibly incisive and uncompromising reviews, um, and a, a really sort of a, a pleasing streak of, sort of irreverent humour, uh, which really appealed to me. And, yeah, um, as the years went on, I just grew to love it more and more, because they they actually would not um, kowtow to games publishers. They said what they thought. Um, they got into a certain amount of hot water with various publishers who tried to sue them and stop them from... <laughs> I remember. <laughs> and even reviewing their games. Sometimes I was trying to stop them sending review copies and issuing them into writs and so on. Um, but uh, no, they wouldn't. They, they would never sort of back down. And the, the, the humour just became more and more sort of prevalent in the magazine that went along. It's, it's been a big part of my life, really. Um, a big inspiration to me. Um, it's partly the reason that I decided to go into um, journalism and uh, publishing myself, um, which I've, I've been doing for about the last 18 years and uh, enjoying very much. Well, um, <laughs> well, let's talk about this Amiga Power, the album. So what was kind of the the inspiration to launch this project and what is it exactly? Uh, well, uh, the... the <laughs> It kind of started a few years back. Um, a friend of mine invited me to, to help put together um, an Amiga remix project that he was working on. 
and um, uh, to in, the, in the role of co-producer. And I enjoyed the experience enormously, and I decided I wanted to try and put together an Amiga uh, remix project of my own. And it just immediately occurred to me that Amiga Power is the ideal sort of subject for it, um, to create a kind of tribute album. And that's exactly what I'm aiming to, to put together. Um, it, it essentially takes the form of a, a two-disc set, um, and it's split between two different kind of approaches, if you like. Um, the first disc um, is a collection of Amiga remixes um, based on game tunes suggested by former Amiga Power contributors. I've been in touch with lots of the old writers, um, including sort of the original Ed Matt Bealby, uh, Stuart Campbell, Mark Ramshaw, um, Cameron Stanley, Rich Pelly, Mill Millington, Gary Penn, Kieran Gillen, um, and they were all incredibly happy to help, and they all came up with a short list of their favourite game tunes and from there I was able to kind of work out which ones we could potentially um, get remixes of uh, working out sort of the licensing agreements and getting hold of the original musicians and so on and uh, yeah just um, making the arrangements to either get the original musicians to do their own remixes which we've done wherever possible or um, if the original musician either wasn't able to do it because uh, they either got working in music or they just didn't have the time and getting someone else to, to do it in their stead um, and yeah, yeah that, that's, that's all worked out very well. And the second CD um, was kind of inspired by Amiga Power's cover discs. Um, they had all kinds of wonderful games and demos and things on their discs over the years. And so, the, yeah, the, the second CD is all remixes based on things that they, they gave away on their uh, cover-mounted discs. <laughs> and just looking at some of the names of the musical talents that you've kind of got on the list, list it reads like, uh, you know, a game screen when I was a kid. <laughs> you've got... <laughs> Just some amazing people on there. I can't believe it. Uh, you've got Jerome Tell as well. You've got Olaf Gustafsson as well. I've not heard of him for years. Chris you know, Hillsbeck, so... Alistair Brimble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Hare. It's just fantastic. Yeah, they, they, everyone's been really, really sort of helpful and very keen to, to get involved. And uh, I, I mean, it, this kind of goes back to say where I was working with this other project, just kind of getting in touch with people and just finding that they had still, still such affection for the the Amiga and uh, and the music that they created back then. Um, and uh, Amiga Power as well, because obviously a lot of people um, who um, who are working on the on the remixes and they were big fans of the, of the magazine too. Well, I mean, obviously, I imagine Future Publishing still own the, the copyright. I mean, have, have they kind of endorsed this? Have you been in touch with them? Uh, they haven't endorsed it exactly, but they, it is licensed from them. Um, but I had to get in touch with them to obviously work, make sure they were okay with us using the Amiga Power name and logo. And so we worked out a licensing agreement with them. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's all been taken care of. They're very helpful, actually. Um, I think they're quite interested in the, 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 the set they would want to do something like this. So obviously it's a bit, it's a bit unusual, but... Uh, yeah, they, they were they were great. They were, they really were sort of very very helpful throughout the whole process. Maybe inspire them to relaunch a magazine again. You never know. <laughs> well, we never know. Um, it'd be nice. Um, there's, uh, there's, I think there has been talk very just sort of vaguely in the past about something like an Amiga Power Annual or something like that. Yeah. And you know, I mean, if this the um, album does well, it'd be nice to if it could sort of springboard off into something like that. I might certainly be. I'd love to see it. Well, this looks incredible. I mean, the, the Kickstarter is going to be starting um, next Friday. Are you aiming for March the 8th? Aiming for March the 8th at the moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely sure at the moment if it's definitely going to hit that. That's what, certainly what I'm going for. Um, but, uh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, ironing out a few little odds and ends at the moment, just uh, finishing up the uh, Kickstarter video and, uh, and getting the, all the pledge bonuses sorted out. But, yeah, that is, that's certainly the aim at the moment, in March, uh, Friday, March the 8th. Excellent. Well, I'll put all the information in our show notes at the retrohour.com. Matthew, good luck with it. Um, we can't wait to see it. So Sounds really you. exciting. <laughs> Thank you very, very much indeed. I really appreciate it. Now, you found something really cool this week, Ravi. Not very often that we talk about new programming languages on this podcast, but tell yeah. us about Script well, 8. I don't know if you'd heard of Pico 8. Pico yeah. 8 was kind of released on a lot of devices, and it was a, a really nice little language just with a limited amount of sprites, a limited area, and you'd be able to create different retro games and distribute them. Well, Script 8 seems to be a JavaScript based kind of version of Pico 8. So it's open source, it's browser based, and you basically create these tiny cassettes. So each game is in a cassette form. And it's fantastic because um, it, it has a feature and uh, it's kind of like live coding. So you can code straight away and it will appear on the screen. I think it's fantastic for kids to be able to learn how they're changing the code can directly change the screen yeah and also there's 
little tape section is great for distributing because you can just send someone your little tape and then they've got a version of your small little retro game. It's like a URL it generates. Yeah, it's yeah. really awesome. With, with all the stuff in the kind of little package. And they're saying it's heavily influenced by Pico 8 and it's uh, open source as well. I'm looking at the aesthetic of it as well. It's, you know, there's kind of very retro 80s sprites and very low colours as well. I mean, look at it. There's only about like eight colours in some of these little demos I've got, which one thing I love about these kind of limitations is it really makes you creative. Yeah, and it and it breaks it down into each little section. So at the top they've got the cassette and then they'll have the code section, an art section, a music section. So you can create your your little beats on a like little kind of tracker and then or a little beat maker and then you can draw your pixels as well and then you can code it on the other one with live coding. I'm into family over this weekend. I just want to play with this now. <laughs> I could literally mess around with it oh, all weekend. You need to make the retro hour platformer. That's what we need. <laughs> or if anyone has got any hot skills, that would be awesome. Do you know, like, AVGN's got a video game about him, hasn't he? Yeah, what, what, what could we do in a game, though? Oh, who knows? It's just going to be a really rude one with us two. <laughs> I don't know. R- Ravi on the mad hunt for guests <laughs> <Yeah>. through levels. <laughs> so if you want to check out Script A, it looks really cool. And again, it's another open source pl- uh, project that people are just putting out there for the fun of it. And I think it's awesome. So if you do want to check that out, maybe get your kids involved as well. It looks really good. I'll stick that link in our show notes as well. Now, before we get into our chat about Football Manager with Kevin Toms, who'd have thought we'd get a new world record on Tetris in 2019? Yeah, so I hope I'm saying his name right. Joseph Saley um, basically was able to beat the Tetris kill screen. So the, everybody thought that Tetris ended on screen 29. Yeah. That was it. You know, it ends on screen 29. But he managed to go past screen 29 live on Twitch and he reached level 33, which is an unknown height. <laughs> <laughs> and whilst he was streaming as well, he was kind of a chatting to people on stream whilst playing it. That's that's really crazy. So this is Tetris on the on the NES, on the NES. Yeah. Um, this game came out in 1989. So yeah. 30 years later, people didn't even realise the game had a kill screen. Well, well that was the kill screen that yeah. they thought, you know, level 29, but yeah. it, it went beyond. That's awesome. And he's only 16 years old as well. Yeah, so he, he must have just been training on it. And can you imagine how good he's going to be on the new Tetris? <laughs> Yeah, the Tetris 99 that everyone's playing at the moment. Isn't that where you go on and you play against 99 other players? Yeah, yeah. Like a, like a battle royale, yeah. Oh, my God. I wouldn't want to be in a game with this guy, though. That's no, good. no, it'd be you and him <laughs> trapped, and it'd be... <laughs> you know, I'm thinking it's probably reading this news item, because we've talked about him on the show before. Do you think Steve Wozniak's reading that going, Damn! <laughs> Damn, I need to get my skills in. Because a lot of people don't know that. He's actually one of the like best Tetris players in the world, isn't he? Yeah, Wozniak? yeah, he, he, he practiced Tetris a lot, and he spends a lot of time on it, but uh, he never got to level yeah. <laughs> 33. Up your game was. Yeah. So uh, there's actually a little video here as well on um, readretro.com. So if you want to check him out. Um, I think it's cool as well that a 16 year old kid is playing a game that's like, you know, double his age pretty much. Yeah, and also that with the kind of live streaming and stuff now, you can't have any doubt behind yeah. it. It's like he just did it live on the s- screen there, you know. Not like back in the day when you'd write to a magazine and just add a couple of zeros at the end of your score. You know? <laughs> yeah. I never did that. No. Yeah, but rather, you about. <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you want to check out that and the rest of this week's stories, we'll put them all in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Right then, let's get nostalgic. Can you smell the grass already? Let's take you back to the 80s. Ravi's got his perm wig on with Kevin Toms, the man behind Football Manager. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it's time to welcome on our very special guest this week. Welcome to the show, Kevin Toms. Good morning. Uh, good evening for us here in the UK, of course, because we're crossing to... Uh, you're in New Zealand, aren't you? I am right now, <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah, so it's actually early in the morning for me. Yeah, I was going to say, it's. Um, we do love doing these uh, weird time zone crossovers because uh, we're, we're getting ready to go to bed you're on your breakfast cereal. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lovely sunny morning starting up. <laughs> well, I mean, kind of going back to, um, we'll get into some stories about Football Manager and, um, you know, th- those classic old school days. But first of all, I mean, just to get a little bit of background, let's get, find out a bit about your uh, your early geek pedigree. What was your first computer? First computer, uh, home computer, was the uh, Video Genie, which is a Tandy TRS-80 clone, quickly followed by a ZX-81. The Tandy TRS-80 was an American obviously Tandy uh, brand, and a Video Genie, I think was, I'm trying to remember, it was a, it's an Asian brand, but I can't remember which country it was now. Mm-hmm. Um, they basically cloned it, they got away with cloning it. And uh, at the first point of creating Football Manager on a home computer, I 
thought that that would be a market for it. And then the ZX81 came along. Because when I launched, the, I did actually launch the game on the Video Genie. Well, actually, I didn't say that. I said TRS-80. Everybody on the Video Genie knew it played TRS-80 software. And uh, I put it out on both uh, machines for about three or four months. I sold 300 on the ZX81 and three on the TRS-80 Video Genie. Well, we'll go into that in a sec. But uh, first, yeah. I just want to ask you, like, who did you yeah. support? And did you go to many football matches as a kid? Yeah, Torquay United. Ah, nice. That's where I grew up. So that's where I grew up was Torquay, uh, well, Paynton, actually. And so Torquay United with my team. So I'm used to suffering. I'm used to, <laughs> I'm used to uh, not expecting much, you know. Um, you know, getting a promotion is a rare event. And uh, at the moment, they're in effectively Division 6, which is pretty shocking. They're doing well yeah. um, <laughs> in Division Six, but uh, yeah, that's that's my original team. I did actually uh, when I because I, I was in Bournemouth for a while, I started going to see Bournemouth, and so I'm also a sort of second fan of AFC Bournemouth as well, which is a little bit higher up. Well, in terms of games that you used to play, I mean, um, what, what kind of stuff were you playing on your on your machine when you were a kid? Then before you got into like programming, I mean, were, were you into like text adventures? Were they an influence on you? Ah, no, this is interesting. I was a programmer before I got the computer. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, most, uh, I think most people who, who wrote computer games um, started learning how to write computer games on, on some kind of home computer. Um, but I was a professional programmer programming mainframes and uh, Univac and IBM mainframes at the time, if I remember rightly. So I already had programmed COBOL and all the stuff like that. So the home computers were like a new thing for me to work with rather than what I learned on. And um, yeah, I'd sort of played, I remember there were text adventures, things like that, you know, and I can also very clearly remember the first Space Invaders machines being in the pubs where I used to go and um, mastering that as well and being disappointed when all that happened when you finally beat it was it started again a little bit faster. Yeah, that was such a phenomenon though when that game came along, I imagine. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was you know, we used to spend a lot of time trying to play that and it was great. Yeah, it was quite something at the time. I imagine that after learning COBOL, like Z80 assembly or machine code must have been like a breeze to learn. <laughs> well, actually, you know, Football Manager was programmed originally in BASIC because it wouldn't have made any sense. So I, had, I did do some assembler in different ways, but it didn't make any sense to program a strategy game in an assembler. Um, so I did it in the uh, native BASIC on the machines, uh, which was one of the few things, that, one of the few games I think that was done in the, the native BASIC. But it's much better because it's essentially a strategy game with a lot of mathematics in it. And uh, that was much better for modifying rather than battling with uh, binary all the time. But the first language I learned was PL1. So it goes even further back. In the 80s, <laughs> the kind of football managers, they were like larger than life characters. You know, you had like Ron Atkinson and Brian Clough yeah. and all these kind of guys. Um, it must have seemed a lot more kind of fun and arty, the idea of a football manager back then. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing started for me way back on, a, on a, as a board game anyway. So, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, I've been sort of interested in it as a game uh, concept for just for a very, very long time. I just thought it was, in, you know, uh, very appealing um, to, to play the role of manager. And you, you're right. Yeah, they were characters then. It was, uh, it was a good era in many ways, a good era, era for computer games because it was a kind of foundation era. Um, but also, um, you know, it was before the big money came in to football as well. So I always thought that to be a pundit, the whole point was you had to be opinionated and, and possibly annoying uh, on TV. You didn't have to be a, a, any, any, any good. You just have to be opinionated. So it's, it still seems to be true, I think. But well, when you were making the original Football Manager, I mean, what, what was kind of the, the idea behind it then and what inspired you to make that game? And um, what was the first text-only version like? Um, well, as I say, it, the roots of it are actually a board game. And I could never get the mechanics right on a board game. And uh, then when I got my hands on home computers, I immediately thought, ah, this will calculate the league table for me and this will... You know, work out the fixture list for me, and uh, you know. It, so it, this is this is far better than trying to sort of make up. Uh, you know, you, when you win, you got three positions or something like that on a board game. And um, so it, it it was a freedom. Um, and um, I did do it as you said. The first one was ZX81, very limited memory, 16K, um, and uh, had to limit the number of teams. Uh, I think it was eight per division. Um, and the only way I could play the match and fit everything in was to do it as text. So I did it as a, 
a bit like the teleprompter on uh, the BBC results, if I'm rightly. Um, I wasn't using the sort of ticker tape effect, but I, a delay as the ga- the goals came up. I um, mean, it was it was deliberately creating tension while you were waiting to see what happened as a result of your decisions. So and it worked. And, and some people still want to play it with the text only version, even now. It's it's very interesting because like people used to experience football in a very different way. Like you said, they'd be either watching teletext or something like that, or they'd be listening to it on the radio, having to imagine the match going yeah. on. You know, and that kind of built the drama in in the in the right way. You know, is relevant yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is drama in it. Quite a lot of drama in football, and that's why it's so much fun. And uh, there's drama in the matches. There's drama in the league tables. There's drama in the cups. It's it's a good escape from reality <laughs> in that way. But it's a, it's a very interesting sport. So when you um, ported it to the, the Spectrum, I mean, was that kind of the point when you decided to add some kind of graphics to show match highlights? Yeah, yeah. No, I can remember doing that very clearly. I can remember where I was working on it in a little flat in Milton Keynes, the one-bedroom flat that I had at the time. And uh, I... Uh, I basically got hold of the spectrum and decided I, I, I had this idea that I could do this because basically the goals popping up one by one was a kind of match highlights. I always thought match highlights would be good because that's the, the excitement of the game, the, you know, the highlights part. And I thought, well, maybe I could do something where people are actually running up and scoring the goals. So having, you know, not being a great artist, I used to draw stick men football footballers when I was a kid um, to, to sort of, you know, just to draw match action. Um, I picked, picked up the same idea and uh, did, you know, obviously people, you know, the graphics weren't so great in those days. And uh, so I drew these little stick men and worked out how to make them run and then uh, drew the lines of the pitch. And then the whole thing then was to create, within a great deal of limitations of memory uh, and what you could do, um, some kind of players running up and shooting at the goal and trying to score the goal. And uh, that, was a, that was a big innovation, actually. I mean, it was only a few months after I re- launched the original text version because I think I was doing that in August, September of 1982. And it took me a couple of months to add that in and then take advantage of the memory to expand the number of teams. So I doubled the number of teams and... Um, and then brought out the, the spectrum, of course, and, you know, with some color as well. Added in a lot of color, like using the team colors where possible of their actual strips in their names. It worked very well. Yeah, it was very, very popular. It, it was exactly like kind of watching the highlights on TV, and you'd kind of think, "Oh, is he going to make it? Oh, yes, yeah. good goal!" You know, every time it would be different. Yeah, I mean, every time it'd be different. It's a very important part. I mean, I've you know, I had people say to me time to time. Oh, you knew when it went a certain way, this was going to happen. No, that's not true. It was programmed to be infinite. There was no, um, because the decisions were made as the match, as, as the players uh, played. Um, there was no pre-programming of what was going to happen. I deliberately designed it that once a player started running with the ball or kicking the ball, um, it was at that moment he decided what was going to happen. So you, you couldn't be sure, no matter what was happening. I mean, if it was... You know, a difficult angle, maybe, but even then, that 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 wasn't certainty at all. But was it the very first football management game? Um, I don't know. It was the very first football management game, for example, on computers. Mm. There may have been others, but it was certainly the first successful one. How did people react to it then? It, you know, it's. Um, I I imagine looking at it from an outsider, you must be thinking, how's this game going to kind of work then? I mean, did, did it take a bit of time for people to get their head around the concept? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, because what most other people were doing at the time was they were taking a known concept like Space Invaders we mentioned or some other known arcade game and trying to adapt it to the smaller computer format. And um, this concept of a, a, a actual strategy game based on football I would go to, I used to go to the microcomputer fairs and I would literally, pe- people come up and they'd see it was text, so it wasn't obvious what it was, and and they'd ask me about it and I had to explain it to people, um, explain what it was, and then they got interested. And then a nice thing started to happen, which was people would then sit down and start playing it and they would get hooked and be playing it for a long time and others would notice that and watch what they were doing and then they used to start explaining to people 
what they were doing. So they were doing the selling for me. You think, oh, this is a game. I play. You do this, this, and this. You know. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they were surprised. Most people were surprised at how much was in it, how much, how many things were in it for for that time. But it did require at least six, 16k and then 48k. At first, there was explanation, and of course, then people started to to get to know the game. Well, today, I mean, if a footballer gives their name to a video game or they feature in it, you know, they charge millions of royalties. Adding mm. real player names back then, did you see that as like a possible legal issue or did it just not even... Oh, it just it? wasn't at that time. I mean, there wasn't really much... Um, was it only their surnames? I can't remember whether I put their initials, but, um, you know, I mean, I don't think they, they had the value then, um, but uh, uh, as they do now, as the brands they are now. But no, they, they, these sort of things... It were there were no issues at that time. It was a very complex game, so you know your standard platformer would just have a level, and you'd have to get to the end, and there'd be different elements. But in this game, you had injuries that would slowly decrease the squad. You know, you'd have to do budgeting. Yeah. You'd have the FA Cup as well as the league. Um, which aspect did you enjoy, kind of making the most out of all of those? Uh, I think the well, the enjoy making. Um, I think the thing that I, I enjoyed um, is that, in fact, you're, you're touching on it there, that although there are, there are a lot of implement, uh, elements in it, they all interact, and that's how I like to make a game. So it seems simple, but there's a lot of interaction. Every little piece um, affects the gameplay. Um, so that's, that, uh, I think that's the key thing. And, and so... When I say affects the gameplay, my aim all the time is to to make it entertaining. Um, so I, I do all of the design from the point of view of being entertaining. And, uh, you know, so uh, an example might be you say there's a cup. Well, in the cup, you will have to use up the fitness of your players to succeed. So that will potentially counteract your success in the league. Um, so those balances... I, I like to have all over the place um, in, in the game. So even on a quite a straightforward, apparently in fact straightforward game, there's a lot of subtle elements working together. And that that's probably my most um, interesting area. Well, did you see any funny uses of the customising tools? I mean, you know, for example, a, a royal family football team or something like that? I didn't see them because <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you know, we didn't have the internet then. Um, but people have told me about them and told me they would, you know, do ridiculous sponsor, you know, sponsors sort of clubs and things like that. But, um, you know, the, the, or, or naming of clubs, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, oh, and I think people have told me about some things like, you know, I mean, obviously the idea was you could put all your favourites in so they could put their their, their own uh, players in. Um, and uh, oh, they'd make different leagues and things like that. Yeah, so people did, but I didn't see so much of it because, as I say, that was one thing you didn't have then was the communication. You know, people were writing letters would be what I would get. Addictive Games was set up to publish this. Was it set up by you? Yeah. And uh, what was yes, the whole was. aim of the company? Uh, the, 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 actually, the name of the company came from Football Manager itself because uh, I was basically lying in bed on a Saturday morning think I need to name the company that sells this game what will I call it and I realized I thought well it seems to be very addictive to people and I thought well why don't I call the company addictive games so yeah that's that's how how it came about it was just the uh, the vehicle to sell um, football manager why did you decide to self-publish then um, I don't think there was any other option I mean I, I, I never there were no uh, I mean this is this was it I mean this game came out at the beginning of establishing the games industry. Uh, they're, they're, um, for example, when I launched the game in January 1982, uh, there were no shops selling computer games, no retail outlets at all. And uh, it's hard to believe. So the only way you could sell was by mail order. All of the sales were by mail order. I advertised in Computer and Video Games magazine, which you know is a long, long living magazine. Um, but then, then that was an early way of doing it. Within a few months at the computer fairs that I went to, the small microcomputer fairs, um, then an odd per, uh, retailer would come up and say, oh, I'm just, I'm going to open a shop to sell computer games and I'd like to stock your game, but you know, we'd like different, slightly different packaging because we need to kind of hang it up on a little rack and things like that. And so I had to start producing slight variations of the, the game packaging. 
And by the end of the year, I mean, I was talking to, you know, Smiths and Boots about stocking in their stores. But uh, at the beginning of the year, um, there was no, there was no, room, no shop in the country to sell. I mean, were you hiring like cassette duplication plants or were you doing it at, like yourself at first? I was doing it myself at first. I can remember, uh, as I said, I had a one bedroom flat and I used to, it used to take about 15 minutes to record if I remember rightly. And I used to be watching TV and I switched the tape recorder on and it literally was in the bedroom um, to record the game. And um, I'd listen because of that buzzing noise it made. So I kind of subliminally was listening to it. I was doing other things and then I would hear when it ended and then I'd go and put, make another one. I can remember buying 300 cassettes from Tandy Wow! <laughs> to make them. You must have been uh, pleased with the kind of initial success of it. Eventually, you sold 500,000 copies. I don't know if you were doing them all yourself. <laughs> um, and you also won a Golden Joystick Award. Yeah, it was actually, uh, uh, I think, more than that that it sold. But yes, um, yes, it did. Yes, it was. Uh, I was up against um, a runner-up, actually, because I was up against The Hobbit, which is very interesting since I'm now sitting here in New Zealand. Mm. But uh, yeah, Melbourne House's Hobbit, we shouldn't have been in the same category. I mean, you know, different games. But, <laughs> but it was early days. But yes, that's true. That happened as well. Well, you kind of continued this uh, simulation and strategy kind of vibe. I mean, the next title was Software Star, which was a game publishing strategy game. I mean, was that kind of influenced from what you've been doing in your day-to-day -day job? Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, yes, it was. And I thought it would be a fun um, sort of thing to write about. And uh, in fact, a lot of people still write to me about that game, tell me they really love that game. Mm. And they've asked me to redo it as well. Um, but um, it's, yeah, it is. It was inspired by that. And... Um, I thought I'd try and get the fun elements of business into it, you know, again, because, I mean, obviously, day-to-day -day business is a lot of just work, um, but I, I wanted to make uh, the fun elements of it, so with charts and trying to boost your game and produce the games, and yeah, uh, it was good. It was um, fun to do that. Yeah, because I know at that time, it, it, the emergence of, like, the UK software industry, it kind of... I remember, you know, documentaries I've seen and reading articles and everything. It kind of felt like, you know, these software houses and programmers coming through, like the new kind of rock stars. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, actually, I mean, there was a... I mean, people often ask me, why did I end up putting my picture on the game? Well, I didn't do that. And um, it was actually when I was attending, attending computer games shows, and I would be talking about, um, you know, uh, the game and explaining it to people. I'd say, I did this or I did that. And they say, did you write it? And I say, yeah. He said, oh, wow, I really love this game. And they'd start talking to me about it. And that would happen quite often. And I, I sort of made a connection in my mind. And you know, somebody asked me about it recently. And I think it's a very clear connection when you think about it. I thought, well, book authors have their names and pictures on the cover. And musicians don't, you know, they don't hide away. They're there because they write the music. I thought, well, what's, what's the difference with computer games? Surely it's a style. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of this work. Why, why shouldn't I say I wrote this? And so that's how I started. But it was innovative at the time. And, um, yeah, and I, you know, it uh, had quite an impact. Um, I still think it was a good move, and I think it should, there should be more of it. I just think that corporate keeping everybody in line was a way not to do it, reason not to do it. But I think it's the way it should be done. How did Addictive grow as a publisher then? Did you start getting approached by people? Eventually, um, but it just grew, uh, just grew it ourselves. I actually relocated from, personally, from Milton Keynes, where I was living initially, um, by, nine, I think it was 1983, and moved to Bournemouth, and that's where it really set up, and I, I started uh, getting staff and had people uh, working for me to cope with the growth, and... Uh, um, converting the games because Football Manager was popular in every format that it, it was converted to. So it was actually on, I think, 13 or 14 different formats in the end and, and dealing with the, the growth of the industry, you know, where it's it changed, as I say, from being just mail order to uh, suddenly being in the big retailers. And then we had uh, middlemen distributors who were distributing the the, the, the games to retailers and of course sales overseas uh, as well and uh, you know uh, eventually you need to need to translate and, and um, but maintaining all that um, and then starting to attend more shows bigger shows so it, all, all of the growth in advertising 
so it just grew. But I was I was running. I was still was still you know running it. That was a that was a problem for me to um, run the uh, business and um, write as well. Well, yeah. Boffin was an interesting title as well. That was written by yeah. a seventeen year old. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember now. Yeah, that, that was another good game. That was on the BBC, wasn't it? And that was an arcade game, I think. Well, how did that deal happen then? How, how did you get... Oh, I, that? what used to happen then, I mean, um, was we started to get people sending uh, games to us and saying, would you publish our games? So we would look at them, you know, and some of them were good enough to, to publish. And then we started doing uh, publishing deals with, with individual developers and publishing them ourselves. So we did that a handful of times. And what, varying success. And what, were we talking like um, the era of like what was it mainly bedroom programmers that were coming to you then, or was it teams by this stage? Yeah, no, no, it was it was individual programmers. They were all individuals uh, that had done their own game and sent through and said, "Would you consider, you know, publishing this?" So um, yeah, and um, so I started expanding out there. It's an interesting time. Well, head coach was a NFL kind of management game. Um, what were the differences in doing this, and was it aimed more at the American audience? Well, that that was a third party game. Uh, I didn't do that. Uh, there was a guy who came to me. He was inspired. Uh, Simon, I think his name was, was uh, inspired by Football Manager, certainly. So it was a lot of similarities. But he wrote it, and we published it for him. And that one, uh, actually, people a lot of people liked that. Uh, basically, it was taking the Football Manager concept and adapting it to American football. What were American audiences like to kind of reach compared to British audiences then? Was that like, a, I imagine, expanding transatlantic must have been a bit of a job? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think we did that too much. It was only a, a, to some extent. I think we were perhaps too small at the time to, to really uh, make that kind of expansion. So I know you did a, a game called President, didn't you, where yes. <laughs> you were like a full country simulator, essentially? Yeah, present was a, a game where, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where, um, yeah, I mean, it combined multiple things. It combined um, being in the, the sort of running a country part um, with the fact that your country was in oil exploration. So you were as economics, you exploring for oil and occasionally you were at war, war as well. And uh, your oil, oil exploration might get bombed by a neighboring country. Um, so I had a number of things interacting together in, in that one. That one suffered a bit because it was uh, launched at a time when we were transitioning to being sold. And so it didn't quite get the support that it should have had. But yeah, I, I did develop some uh, interesting technologies when I was doing that. Um, I remember for I was doing virtual machines at that point to be able to handle conversions to all these different formats. So I did quite a bit of that on President. Well, well, in 1988, Football Manager 2 hit the shelves and it was released for all the systems in kind of one go. It must have uh, really helped doing that president game before. Football Manager 2 you're talking about? Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, absolutely. And I did use the same uh, uh, technology. So um, Football Manager 2 uh, was on all formats. And I think if I remember rightly, I counted there were 40 versions at release. Uh, it was a bit of a monster uh, d in terms of doing that um, because, I mean, I'm talking about the tape and disc as well as the different languages and all the different machine formats as well. Um, and all of them had the same core of code that I'd written, uh, the nucleus of code I'd written in fourth, yes, and uh, with some plug-in um, the, uh, sprites, uh, animation code. Um, basically, it was a, like a virtual machine because it was the machine dependent parts were um, were uh, done separately um, by, uh, I had about half a dozen other developers working with me on those machine dependent parts, but all of the AI, the, the uh, uh, control and uh, all of the strategy, everything was being done by this nucleus code which I'd written in um, fourth. And by this stage, you were owned by Prism Leisure. Yeah, the company yeah. was, yeah. How, right. how come you sold to them then? Um, that came about, actually, it was one of those things that just happened um, because um, I'd had a meeting with a business advisor and I said, look, I, I can't write games very effectively anymore because I'm sort of overwhelmed by all the business work I have to do running the company. And uh, he said, well, what do you want to do? He said, I said, what do you mean? I said, I was complaining about all these problems. And he said, 
well, what do you want to do? Which, which thing do you want to do? Do you want to run the business? In which case you should focus on that. Or do you want to write games? And I said, well, I'd like to write games again. And he said, well, you know, when we look at, we'll look at somehow getting rid of the business part then. And uh, I happened to be at their offices and they said they were going to go public and they were looking for an acquisition. And I sat there thinking, do I say something? <laughs> And uh, I, so I did say something. I said, well, I'm thinking of selling. So, and that's how it came about, basically, step by step from that. You know, we hear that story a lot about people who, you know, get into the games industry, like, you know, from the creative side, but kind of by default, you end up becoming like a, a company owner and having to do the finances and everything as well, even though you never intended yes. to do that. Yeah, that, that's it. I was good at certain things. So that made it harder. You know, I had a good sense of, uh, good sense of marketing, for example, but uh but yeah that that i mean there was no other choice i mean it was it was when i started you know there was no publisher to go to so i just started selling the games myself as many others did at that time they just started selling the games themselves and none of us knew what we were doing at the start we were all i think i was 24 years old when i started the company i mean that wasn't very old you know mature you might say there wasn't no choice so yes it's step by step you're you're then running a company but you're running a company for a creative product i think that's the challenge there if you if you if you're just selling widgets, you know maybe you say, oh, "This is great. I love selling all these widgets." But um, I I think if you've got a creative part, it's harder to to give that up. Well, the customizer utility was also uh, came out as an expansion kit. Um, was this popular as well? Because you can make your own cups and stuff now. Yeah, no, that that, that uh, doing it as an expansion kit. Yes, it was very popular. In fact, amazingly, at one point, both things were in the charts in the top ten, which was uh, the game and the expansion kit. Um, so yeah, that 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 went down well. Um, I think that was a good move at the time. Well, then obviously we we had the World Cup in nineteen ninety, Italian ninety, which I remember being a kid, and that kind of seemed like football had kind of gone to the next level. It was suddenly big and glamorous and it just seemed like, you know, Italian 90 was suddenly everywhere and there was a lot of money being pumped into football. And mm. you released Football Manager World Cup Edition for that too. Yeah. Um, became yeah. a big box, you had the wall chart and stuff too. I mean, did you kind of find that worldwide interest in football got more attention on your game? Yeah, I think the Football Manager 2 was actually the bigger seller. Mm. Uh, the World Cup was not a, uh, World Cup Edition was not a pleasant experience for me. There was um, a lot of it was very heavy workload and uh, it wasn't, you know, it was kind of like I wasn't able to do it the way I wanted it, although it was okay. It was okay as a game. It was one I wasn't satisfied with. Um, and um, I would like to have been able to finish the product properly. But I did learn something. This is something I, I did learn from, because I had a habit of, if you look at Football Manager 1, Football Manager 2, and the World Cup edition, and, and some other things I've done since, I used to... Uh, completely re revolutionized the game each time. So I just write a completely new game, different structure, completely change it. And I think I made it hard for myself doing that. Um, I think uh, I see it slightly differently now. I would more evolution than revolution. Well, it kind of, uh, one interesting aspect I found uh, was that you could basically have press talking to the players and it would reflect how kind of media savvy the players are as well, but also it would affect the morale of the club. I thought that really yes. reflected the football at the time. Yes, no, I was picking up on things like that. I mean, it's true. It does happen. And uh, I was starting to pick up on stuff like that. Well, you must have started like looking at other football manager games out there and lots of management sims. Uh, was this frustrating or kind of flattering to see a lot come out later on? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I always kind of, uh, I didn't really pay much attention because I traveled, I've been abroad and, uh, you know, uh, I didn't really follow that closely what was happening um, because I've been doing other stuff. And um, I, you know, I did keep sort of keep along the idea of doing some more myself and I've done it sort of dabbled, kept it going part time, probably my, almost ever since really. Um, but I didn't pay much attention, no, to, to what else was uh, going on. Occasionally, I'd look at something and I'd say, oh, there's too much statistics. I don't like this. You know, so uh, I you know, didn't really find anything that really appealed to me. Did, did you manage to get a look at a championship manager at all? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's a different kind of game. Actually, it's interesting that people make these analogies because I, I don't. I think uh, just it's about the same subject, but a completely different kind of game as far as I'm concerned. It's only the subject that's the same. Um, 
you know, it's like, uh, you know, I make more analogies to music. It might be still rock music, but they're very, very different, you know, to different types of, uh, different ways of uh, using the genre. Well, you must so, be amazed to kind of see the splitting of IDOS and um, the, them losing the rights to use uh, the championship manager name and now using football manager. So you're kind of coming into a <laughs> shop and seeing football manager 2019. It's very strange. <laughs> It's very strange, and I, and I do see it. And um, yeah, I, I, it, it is kind of odd. But I mean, a lot of people did use the name Football Manager in different ways afterwards. Um, but that 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 particular thing is 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 strange. And uh, yeah, I, I always will be strange. I think that's just the way it is. Well, I mean, if people were missing your, you know, take on the the football simulation, then um, football star manager has come along in yes. recent years. T- tell us about this then, and why you decided it was the right time to do that. Well, actually, it was uh, about three years ago. I was just online. I just had uh, people who were following me on Facebook or something like that. I have a f- Facebook page, and. Uh, I just got the idea. I just thought, you know, I've been mobile developing mobile software for quite a while now, and I played around with um, doing a a football management game on mobile. But I I spent too long on that. I spent five years doing that. Uh, Took it, did, did, made made a painful process for myself. Um, And uh, then I suddenly thought, why don't I just renew or redo the original game? for mobiles and um i just suggested shall i how about if i rewrote my original football manager for mobiles and i got a very very positive reaction yeah 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 please do that do that you know and so i did so i based it on the original game but it is a completely new uh game and um you know some variations on it but it has very much the same feel and gameplay of the original i mean the same gameplay same games designer same games programmer um that that has uh, an impact on that, and, and people love it because the similarities are strong enough that they feel nostalgia, you know, when they play uh, play the game, and um, they, you know, they remember they remember their experiences of playing it the first time. They get a lot out of that, but also the game has the same addictive quality. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's it's easy to play, but very much fun and. Um, and people are finding it refreshing too because other football management games, so although I've done it as a retro game, I mean, I've even included the original players, the original teams and things like that from the, from, from the very first game. Um, uh, it has also modern players in it as well. Um, uh, 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 that uh, What they particularly are finding is that um, compared to other games uh, that are out there, um, it's much easier to play and you don't have to work so hard and they, they like this simple i mean one person said to me he said um i've played the latest football manager you know the the the, the big football manager and uh he said uh i've spent 200 hours on it he said i've played seven seasons and i, I said well if you play mine i said and you played 200 hours you'll probably play 200 seasons yeah you know and I do have people, I mean, who, who've played 500 more, uh, more seasons of, of my new game and, and enjoying it and they play it, you know, in their downtime on flights all over the place because it doesn't need Wi-Fi or anything like that. Uh, and you can customize it just like the original. And um, I, I, I originally released it as uh, a text only, just like I did with the original, just to get it out there. And then I spent a few months, it was such a parallel, it was a few months in like August, September, uh, uh, a while later, you you know, later on, I think nearly a year later, and added animation with the stick men. And then I enhanced that animation with some sprites uh, some months later. Um, So, but in fact, when you play the game, there's three options. You can actually play the text the retro sprites, stick, stick men, or, or sprites, and they all um, they all work, um, and they use the same kind of um, you know. It doesn't matter which you choose, you get. The, I can't say similar results because there's you know the randomization is slightly different, but mm. there's no advantage using either. Uh, but you can play any each, any of the three ways each match. Um, 
so yeah, that that is a you know five star rated. Very people love that that game. I'm very happy with it. I've sold thousands of them. Yeah, um, I'm looking on Amazon and, here, and the reviews are amazing. I mean, people saying, I, I think you made a really good point there that you know it's still as addictive as the original. It's kind of like you know a good movie is a good movie for all time. You know, a good bit of music is yeah. a good bit of music. A good game is timeless, I guess. Yeah, I've actually got it on uh, a lot of formats too. I mean, I got it on iOS, uh, Android. Kindle Fire, as you say, you've seen it on Amazon there. Mm. Uh, also, Windows and uh, Mac, and it's highly rated on all of them. Um, oh, yeah, it's so, currently 13th in entertainment on uh, iTunes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, it's it, it's really good. And in fact, my, my view of it is that I produced a very good game again and very happy with what I produced. And uh, my only problem is just people people don't know it exists. <laughs> So the only problem is a marketing problem. People don't know I've actually made it. Uh, and when they do, they're very happy when they when they buy it. But uh, um, yeah, it's 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 definitely a successful successful game that people are just starting to learn is there, and very much retro, but very enjoyable today. I mean, you know, it's but the fact there's no Wi-Fi, people like it for things like going on a flight. They play it on a flight or yeah. a long journey and things like that. Well, I'm sure anyone that's listened um, right to the end of the interview, Kevin, will be, you know, dying to get hold of a copy of it. So we'll obviously put the links to um, where people can get it from in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Um, and it's wonderful that you've kind of gone back to roots and are, are doing Football Manager again. So uh, thank you yeah. so much for coming on, Kevin. It's great to see you've still got the passion for it too. Yeah, no, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I really enjoy the work. I love writing the game, so I want to do more. Maybe I could get Forrest to the Premier League again. We'll see. Uh- <laughs> yeah, and all, all I got to do is look for Kevin Toms on the App Store, so it's still my name. That's the way to find it. Excellent. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for talking to us. Been a pleasure. Thanks for taking me back through some of the memories. Mm-hmm.